Today on Trucks, we're going to turn our stock Chevy pickup truck into a sinister Silverado by bolting on a six inch lift kit as well as some new wheels and rubber. After that, we'll take a look at a classic ride from Dodge, the 79 Little Red Express. Then it's time to roll Wicked Willys back into the shop for a complete cooling system upgrade. That's all today on Trucks. Hey everybody, welcome to the truck shop. We appreciate you hanging out with us. Today we're going to take a 99 Silverado and give it some elevation as well as new wheels and rubber. But hey, that's only the beginning of what we have in mind for this big old Chevy that from here on out is going to be known as Project Sinister Silverado. Now one of the biggest projects to strike fear in the heart of the do-it-yourselfer is a lift on an independent front suspension. Now granted, there's more work involved, but the benefits, as we'll show you, are definitely worth it. One of the biggest benefits being, of course, more ground clearance under the body. We're also going to up the clearance under the truck because we'll be able to put much bigger tires on it, not to mention increased approach and departure angles due to the raised bumper height. And let's face it, a six inch lift is definitely going to give us the stance we want for Project Sinister Silverado. Now we're going to do this with Superlift's brand new six inch lift. Now, I know this looks like a lot of parts, but don't panic. We're going to show you where it all goes here in a minute. Now, the kit comes with new shocks, cross members, skid plates, shock hoops, a whole bunch of drop brackets, as well as a brand new front drive shaft. The first thing we need to do to make room for all the new hardware is get the brake calipers off. Now, the good news about this is that you don't have to disconnect the brake hoses, which means you won't have to rebleed your system when you put it all back together. It's also a good idea to use wire ties to keep the caliper up out of the way. Just make sure you aren't pinching or stretching the hoses. Also, don't forget to disconnect the ABS wire. Now, you may have noticed that our front suspension doesn't use coil springs. It's got torsion bars instead. Now, they run from the adjuster here in the back up to the lower control arm. Now by turning this adjusting screw you change the amount of twist on the bar and that changes your torsional load on your front suspension. Now for those of you that think that you can come back here and just crank up your torsion bar and get the kind of lift you want, forget it. That's not the way to do this properly. Now to put this kit on, these torsion bars need to come out. So we're going to mark them first. Then back out the adjusting screw. Using this torsion bar tool, you can take out the adjustment stop and then unload the bar. Slide the torsion bar forward and then pull the adjusting arm out of the cross member. Finally, unbolt the cross member and get it out of the way. In order to free up the differential, we have to unbolt the axles disconnect the electrical and vacuum tube <coughs> before you can undo the drive shaft. <coughs> Once you have the rear cross member out of the way, you can roll a jack under the differential. All right. Unbolt it and roll it out. Now we can deal with this steering linkage. All we need to do here is knock off these tie rod ends. Now remove the center link assembly from the pitman arm and the idler arm. Now keep in mind, you have to reuse these parts, so don't just toss them in the garbage or you'll be cussing yourself and us later on. Now the stage has the center link and the sway bar undone, it's time to lose these control arms. But first I need to pop the shocks off, as well as these bump stops. Then with the jack in place, I can undo the lower control arm bolts, followed by the upper control arm bolts. Now these things aren't that heavy, but they are awkward, so an extra set of hands is always helpful here. One of the neat things about this kit is you don't have to do any welding. However, you do have to do some cutting. So using a plasma cutter or a torch, cut off this lower differential mount here on the driver's side.
After that, cut out the cups for the bump stops and grind them down. You'll also need to do some grinding on the front and rear upper control arm brackets and a little on the tip of the pitman arm. Finally, chisel off the rivets that hold the old torsion bar cross member bracket. Now, don't screw these up because you've got to use them again later on. Believe it or not, we can start putting this thing back together. First up is the sway bar, which goes in the factory position with the ends inverted so they step down instead of up. <coughs> then you can install the factory link to the super lift center link and hang everything from the pitman and idler arms. The differential drop brackets are next. Now these babies go right to the factory bolts. Now we can wrestle the differential into place. Now if I've calculated this right, <laughs> Mel has the heavy end. Thanks, pal. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to leave these bolts a little loose so we can adjust them later on. With the differential loosely bolted into place, we're ready for the control arm brackets, but first we're going to slide this hoop for the shocks into the frame mounts. Then we can mount the upper control arm bracket as well as the lower control arm bracket through the factory holes. With the center link mounted to the new front cross member, I'm going to bolt this cross member in between these two brackets we just put in. Then we'll connect the steering stabilizer up to the center link. Now that Stace has the front cross member secure, we can work on the rear. With the lower control arm brackets already in place, it just bolts right up. After you hook up your electrical and vacuum lines, tighten everything down. We got to take a break. Trucks will be back after this. Later on Trucks, we'll show off a Dodge pickup that could run with the fastest production vehicles of its time. But first, we need to finish giving our Silverado its sinister stance. Just can't get enough of trucks? Check us out online at TrucksTV.com. Thanks for hanging with us, everybody. We've already got the front and rear cross members in place on our 6-inch super lift. Now we're starting to mount the upper and lower control arms. As you can see, they go right up to a factory location. The only difference is they're six inches lower. To keep our suspension from moving around on us when we hit the trail, the kit comes with these kicker braces that run from the rear cross member back to the cross member for the tranny. Now the brakes, tie rod ends, and axle shafts all go back to where they originally came from. And what's different is this sway bar drop bracket. It extends the end links to make up for the lift. Now we're ready for the shocks. One of the cool things about this setup is it uses dual shocks for increased performance on road and off. Now we can deal with the torsion bar cross member. Now these factory brackets that you made sure not to screw up bolt right into this lowering bracket that comes with the kit. After that, remount the cross member and then the torsion bars using the marks you made earlier. While Stace is hooking up our brand new drive shaft, I can put the finishing touches on the front end, which are these skid plates. Now, if you have to ask what these are for, you probably shouldn't be driving a truck off-road. Now that we've taken the fear factor out of lifting an independent front suspension, we can get started on the rear. Now, Superlift's got a couple options on this. You can get the full lift out of brand new leaf springs, or you can use lift blocks like we're going to do. First thing we need to do is get a jack under the pumpkin for support. Then you can undo the shocks and pop off the U-bolts before dropping the axle down to make room for the new Superlift blocks that sit right on top of the factory block. Now you do need to do some modifications to the rear brake lines and the emergency brake cable. I took this stock bracket from the top of the frame rail, rebent the hard line, and then remounted it to the bottom of the frame rail. This gives you plenty of slack in your hose. For the emergency brake cables, Superlift supplies a drop bracket that bolts right to the factory holes. All we have left to do back here is jack up the rear end to seat the blocks 
slide on the new U-bolt and tighten them down. Then we're ready for our shock upgrades. Bottom line, the rear install is much easier than the front, whether you're going with blocks or leaf springs. Of course, now that we have our lift installed, it uh, really won't do us any good without the right wheel and tire combination. And since we don't want the tire popping off the rim when we air down for the trail, we had Champion Wheels install this set of B-lockers on these really cool centerline billet thrust wheels. They cut off the outer rim and then they weld on a new rim that the tire bead lays against. Then bolt on the outer ring. Now this sandwich is down on the rubber and there is no way that thing's going to come off that rim. Now since we named our 99 Chevy Sinister Silverado, we couldn't run just any old tire. So we're going to go with Mickey Thompson's brand new evil looking 35 13 and a half Baja Claws. Well, there's no doubt our Chevy's got a whole new attitude now. But keep in mind, this is only chapter one of Project Sinister Silverado. For the rest of the story, you'll just have to keep watching trucks. Don't go away, we'll be right back. For more information about trucks, check us out online at truckstv.com. Thanks for hanging with us, everybody. You know, back in the late 70s, muscle cars had been reduced to mere memories. Government regulations had choked out the horsepower, and high compression big block engines were pretty much history. However, like trucks, for the most part, were exempt to these rules. So, in one last effort, Dodge decided to take advantage of this. Now, it only lasted for a couple years, 78 and 79, but the Little Red Express will always be part of automotive history. And the owner of this little slice of Americana is Larry Webb from Athens, Tennessee. Dodge only produced a little more than 7,000 of these trucks in its two-year run, and this one here only has 47,000 original miles on it. Now the first thing that catches your eye on the Little Red Express are these side stacks. And they're not only factory, but they're also functional. They have a stainless cover to keep from burning your hands. And the mufflers are right under the doors, and they run up to a set of headers they're bolted up to a 360 cubic inch small block. Now that pumps out 225 horse at the rear wheel, which made this rig the fastest production vehicle on the road in 78 and 79. And yes, that does include the Trans Am as well as the Vet. Another thing that's impossible to miss on this ride is the badging on the door. Let's just say there was no doubt what you were driving off the lot here. The interior is pretty spartan by today's standards with a bench seat and no headliner, but it did have everything you need including full instrumentation as well as wood graining on the dash and doors. The beds on the Express only came in a step side. <laughs> they were just begging to be stuffed with some big old fat tires. Looks like we're going to have to talk to our friend Larry about some upgrades back here. Although he probably won't want to lose these original wheels because that's about the hottest thing you could get back then. Dodge definitely wasn't afraid to hang a little wood on the little red truck, and I do mean wood. No fake plastic stick-ons here. They covered the outside of the bed and the back of the tailgate with half-inch oak inserts. And if that wasn't enough, they also laid down one-inch planks in the bed. This exterior package, the designers at Dodge wrapped around a hot 360 motor, beefy transmission, and the 350 gear in the rear, was just the beginning of what's become the sport truck movement we know today. Bottom line, the Little Red Express understood that all work and no play wasn't good, <laughs> even for a truck. If you want more trucks, check us out online at truckstv.com. Welcome back, everybody. You know, nothing can ruin a trail ride quicker than a motor that overheats. And let's face it, if you're running up a steep incline, two or three miles an hour, hot summer sun beating down on you, a lot of horsepower under the hood, overheating can be a problem, especially if you've got an inferior cooling system. We're going to avoid that disaster with Wicked Willys by using a complete system we got from Evans Cooling. Now you can change out a radiator or a thermostat, but don't kid yourself. The best results always come from a complete system. This one comes with the radiator, water pump, thermostat, as well as Evans Waterless Coolant. 
Now don't worry, your ears are not playing tricks on you. This is in fact a waterless system and that's got some definite benefits that we'll talk about later on. Now in a water-based system like our Mopar here, 30% of your coolant runs out of this bypass and right back into the hot motor. It never makes it to the radiator. Now with the Evans system, this bypass is plugged so all the coolant runs right through the radiator. Speaking of that radiator, we had Evans build us an all aluminum replacement for our stocker and as you can see, it has all the stock measurements. Now one of the biggest advantages to aluminum as opposed to copper or brass is you have much bigger tubes inside which gives you better flow. Now the thermostat's also uniquely designed. As you can see, it has these small little vent holes that allows the air to escape when you fill up the system. Now the new water pump's also been massaged a bit. It's got a different sized impeller with this backing plate for greater flow. They also add an air bleed screw so you can release trapped air inside the impeller cavity. Of course, this orange house of color paint is our own touch. A common problem you run into when doing a motor swap is you don't always have enough room for a mechanical fan. So we went to Flexalite and picked up this electrical compact dual fan that you can hook up to a thermostat or a manual switch in the cab. This setup also bolts right up to the radiator. But before we can install the fans, we need to deal with the problem of radiator hoses. Now in any kind of a custom application, the only way to go is with these cool flex hoses that we got from Total Performance. Now they're made out of seamless copper tubing that's been chrome plated. Now you just take a hacksaw and cut them to the length that you want and then bend them to whatever shape they need to be. Then you finish them off with these really cool end clamps. These are also available for heater hoses. Now once we have the system completely sealed, we can give Wicked Willies a drink of this waterless coolant. This stuff has a boiling point of more than 350 degrees at zero pressure and in freezing temperatures it shrinks which makes cracking a block impossible. If you work on trucks long enough, eventually you're going to break off a bolt. And there's nothing worse than feeling a bolt get looser when it's supposed to be getting tighter. Now keep in mind, most bolts are held in place by tension on the bolt head itself. Now once that's broken off, there's little or no tension on the remaining threads. So before you reach for an easy out in a drill, grab yourself a small punch and a hammer. Tap around the outside of the broken off piece. You should be able to back it out. This can save you hours of needless frustration. A burnout was actually designed to serve a purpose other than just pure crowd pleasure and smoky skies. In the early days of drag racing, drivers discovered getting heat in the rear tires actually made for a better launch, which meant better ETs. And now truck gear, parts, tools, and equipment for pickups and sport utilities. Now depending on the lift you put on your truck, you'll need a place to mount up to a 44 inch spare. And since under the bed's not an option, a really cool look is in the bed itself. This spare tire mount from RJR Products with its all steel construction allows you to do just that. You can also lock your spare in place to prevent theft. But if you need to put your truck to work, the mount's removable. The RJR spare tire mount runs about $220. When it comes to bed liners, you've got the plastic drop-in kind and, of course, the spray-in kind. Well, Wise Industries has their own approach to this with what they call the bed rug. Now, this is made out of a polyester carpet that's bonded to a closed cell foam, which is waterproof, so it withstands the elements. Now this liner fits the inside of your bed like a glove and installs in just a few minutes and pops out even quicker if you need to wash it. Take care of the business end of your truck or SUV with a bed rug for about 400 bucks. Spend any time with your vehicle off-road and you're bound to need some trail side repairs. That's not going to be a problem if you have a Leatherman. The Super Tool comes complete with pliers, Phillips and standard head screwdrivers, knives, and just about anything else you might need to complete repairs that can put an end to a great day on the trail. The Leatherman comes with a 25-year guarantee and goes for about 80 bucks. That's going to do it for Truck Gear. Here's a preview of next week's show. It's the installation of a supercharger on a 98 S10. 
will blow your mind by squeezing V8 horsepower out of a 4.3 V6. After that, we'll take you for a ride with off-road legend Walker Evans and the Championship Off-Road Racing Series before heading back to the shop to help you out with some vintage upgrades. That's all next week on Trucks. That's going to do it for this week's show. Thanks for being with us. We look forward to trucking with you again next week. is an RTM production.